Welcome to section one in musculoskeletal anatomy. In this section, we will be discussing the brachial plexus. Here's an image of the brachial plexus, and this image can be found in section one of your musculoskeletal anatomy text. Notice that there are many nerves that aren't labeled. This is intentional. The labels that you do see indicate very important nerves to remember. Here's a table showing these important nerves. Notice that I have arranged a column just for the motor function of each nerve, as well as associated sensation. I will also point out where injuries are located, and on the far right side, there is a column that indicates how the patient will present if the nerve is damaged. Now this particular lecture will focus on only the top four rows, so this line and above. So the upper trunk, and three nerves that are derived from the upper trunk, the suprascapular nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the axillary nerve. When we look back at this image, we can see the trunks. We have the upper trunk, the middle trunk, and the lower trunk. Now, as you can see, there are cords, divisions, trunks, and roots. And there's also all these branches down here. Don't overthink this image. What you really need to know are these branches. So I wouldn't get wrapped up in the roots, cords, or divisions. It's important to conceptually understand the trunks though, particularly the upper trunk and the lower trunk. And the next thing to conceptually understand is take these roots and link them to the spinal nerve roots discussed in neurophysiology. So each one of these projections are spinal roots and those project to these roots. So they're one and the same. So just connect these conceptually. Okay, enough of all that. Let's dive into these important branches, starting with the axillary nerve. The main muscle to remember with the axillary nerve is the deltoid muscle. The motor function of the deltoid muscle is shoulder abduction, specifically abduction above 15 degrees. The muscle responsible for shoulder abduction below 15 degrees, or zero to 15 degrees, is the supraspinatus muscle, which you can see labeled down here, innervated by the suprascapular nerve. And we will discuss this muscle and its associated nerve later. This figure shows the course of the important nerves of the brachial plexus. Notice the axillary nerve labeled right here. You can see the deltoid creating this contour right in this region. Notice how close the axillary nerve is to the head of the humerus, this region right here. So you can imagine if there's trauma to this region, the axillary nerve can be damaged. There are three injury scenarios that you need to remember. There is anterior dislocation of the humerus. The second is fractured surgical neck of the humerus. And the surgical neck is in this region. And you can see the axillary nerve traverse behind the surgical neck or posterior to the surgical neck. And lastly, anything that damages the upper trunk. And if the axillary nerve is damaged, the patient will be unable to abduct the arm above 15 degrees. Going back to the table, we have listed the locations where injury can occur, surgical neck, anterior dislocation of the humeral head, or upper trunk damage. And if this occurs, there will be no abduction, which means the patient will have their arm at their side. Now we didn't talk about sensation yet, but this is a fairly intuitive point. The axillary nerve innervates the skin around the shoulder region. This image shows the cutaneous innervation of the nerves from the brachial plexus and can be found in section one of your musculoskeletal anatomy chapter. The deltoid muscle is up here in this region and you can see the contour of the deltoid right here. And the axillary nerve is what innervates this deltoid muscle as we just discussed. And now this skin covering the deltoid is also provided by the axillary nerve as highlighted with this green area. Now notice the suprascapular nerve is labeled up here and it covers just the superior most portion of the shoulder. It's above the region that is covered by the axillary nerve, and it's actually more on the neck up here. And its name gives a clue as to what area of skin it covers. Supra, meaning above, and scapular, meaning scapula. So above the scapula. So we'd expect the suprascapular nerve to be up here. Anyways, ignore the suprascapular nerve for now. Just think of the deltoid muscle being innervated by the axillary nerve, and the skin around the deltoid muscle as also being innervated by the axillary nerve. Now let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A 45-year-old man presents to the emergency department holding his right shoulder and wincing in pain. His speech is incoherent and he appears intoxicated. A witness to the incident states the patient was hit multiple times in the arm with a pool cue. A radiograph of his arm is shown below. What neurological deficits will most likely be seen in this patient? Now hopefully you can see on the image that the surgical neck of the humerus is broken. That's right in this region. This should immediately make you think of the axillary nerve. And if this nerve is damaged, what muscle will be dysfunctional? The deltoid muscle. So this patient will be unable to abduct his shoulder above 15 degrees. And that answers part of the question, but the question really asks what neurological deficits will most likely be seen. So that includes motor and sensation. So what sensation will be lost? Well, it's simple, sensation over the shoulder. Now let's talk about the musculocutaneous nerve. The main thing to remember about this nerve is that it innervates the biceps brachii muscle, as written here. The biceps brachii muscle is responsible for elbow flexion and forearm supination. 
and you can see labeled right here the musculocutaneous nerve. The image on the left highlights the biceps brachii muscles, which you can see highlighted in red on both arms. The image on the right highlights the function of the biceps brachii muscles. Notice this man is doing biceps curls. He is flexing his elbows. Notice also that this man is holding his palms to the ceiling, as one typically does when performing this exercise. This indicates supination. And if you forget the difference between supination and pronation, just remember supination is like holding a bowl of soup with your hands, so your palms would be towards the ceiling. So again, the biceps brachial muscle is responsible for elbow flexion and forearm supination. Now on to injuries. The musculocutaneous nerve can be damaged with anything that damages the upper trunk, which is similar to the axillary nerve. If the musculocutaneous nerve does not function, that means the patient cannot supinate or flex their elbow. So this would cause the elbow to be extended, because you can't flex, and pronated, because you can't supinate. And with this damage, there will be a sensation loss, and the loss would be around the lateral forearm. Going back to this image, notice the musculocutaneous nerve labeled here. As you can see, this nerve provides sensation to the lateral forearm, and it does this specifically through the lateral antebrachial cutaneous branch, which is in parentheses here. Don't worry about that branch though. If you hear its name, just put that in your mind as the musculocutaneous nerve. Also, for the sake of being complete, here is another area of skin innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. Although it's true that the nerve provides sensation up here, the fact is useless practically, so ignore it. Just know that the musculocutaneous nerve innervates the lateral forearm, as shown down here. So now let's do a question to apply this. A 14-year-old boy presents to a neurology clinic because his right arm doesn't seem normal. He briefly states that he recently experienced some trauma. On exam, the patient cannot feel sensation in the region indicated by the physician's finger. Assuming the patient's presentation is the result of a denervated branch of the brachial plexus, what actions will the patient be unable to perform? Okay, so we know a couple of things. The patient cannot feel sensation to this part of his arm, and we're assuming it's a branch of the brachial plexus that is the problem. So what nerve should we be thinking of? The musculocutaneous nerve. And what muscle does the musculocutaneous nerve innervate? The biceps brachii muscle, which again does what? Flexion of the elbow and supination of the forearm. So with damage to the musculocutaneous nerve, the biceps brachii muscle will be dysfunctional, so there will be no flexion of the elbow or supination of the forearm, which answers the question. These are the actions the patient will be unable to perform. Now let's talk about the suprascapular nerve. This innervates two important muscles, the supraspinatus muscle and the infraspinatus muscle. You can see the suprascapular nerve right here. So now let's look at the muscles innervated by the supraspinatus nerve. The left image shows the supraspinatus muscle from a posterior view, and the right image shows the infraspinatus muscle. The supraspinatus muscle is responsible for shoulder abduction. Notice how it connects to the scapula over here and then crosses over the humeral head and attaches to the humerus over here. So with contraction, you can imagine that the humerus actually elevates or abducts, specifically abduction from zero to 15 degrees. Now let's look over at the infraspinatus muscle. Notice that it extends from the scapula over here and it attaches to the lateral side of the humerus over here. So if it contracts, the muscle will pull the humerus, causing it to rotate laterally. This is called external rotation. So let's go back to the table. The infraspinatus muscle is responsible for external rotation. And I use a word to help me remember this connection, infection. INF for infraspinatus and action for external rotation. So infection. This nerve's function can be damaged with anything that damages the upper trunk. And how will the patient present if the suprascapular nerve is damaged? Well, if the supraspinatus muscle doesn't work, they can't abduct from 0 to 15 degrees, so the arm will be at the side, very similar to the presentation of an axillary nerve injury. Next, if the infraspinatus muscle doesn't function, the arm will not be able to externally rotate. Remember infection. So infraspinatus, external rotation. If you can't do it, you will be internally rotated. As for sensation, notice that the suprascapular nerve covers the area just above the axillary nerve. This makes sense when you think of the muscles it innervates. The supraspinatus and the infraspinatus muscles are high up on the arm, so the suprascapular nerve should innervate this region high on the shoulder, and it does. So if there's damage to the suprascapular nerve, this region high on the shoulder would lose sensation. Now let's do a question to apply this. A 23-year-old woman with cerebral palsy presents as a new patient to a family medicine clinic. The physician notices that her left arm is internally rotated. When asked if she can raise her arms to the ceiling, her right arm elevates but her left arm remains next to her body. Based only on these two physical exam findings, what muscles are not functioning? Hopefully you notice that this cerebral palsy patient has difficulty with external rotation. As you can see, her arm is perpetually internally rotated. And what muscle causes external rotation? The infraspinatus muscle. So remember the memory hook. 
infection. If you can't externally rotate, then your infraspinatus muscle is dysfunctional. So the infraspinatus muscle is likely not functioning in this patient. So that answers part of the question, which asks, what muscles are not functioning? So what other muscles should we be thinking of here? Well, hopefully you notice that she is unable to raise her arm above her head. It remains next to her body. So what muscle are we thinking about here? The supraspinatus. Now you may remember that the deltoid muscle does abduction above 15 degrees, which means we could also think of the deltoid muscle, even though it is innervated by the axillary nerve, not the suprascapular nerve like the other two muscles. But that doesn't really matter in the context of a patient with cerebral palsy, because in cerebral palsy it really takes place in the brain, and so we're kind of skipping the brachial plexus and going straight to the muscles and their proper function. So it's totally reasonable to have supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and deltoid dysfunction. Now let's finally talk about the upper trunk. Once again, the upper trunk is right here, and notice how the C5 and C6 spinal nerve roots join to form the upper trunk. And what nerves did we just discuss? The musculocutaneous nerve, which as you can see, originates from the trunk, and the axillary nerve, which also originates from the upper trunk, and the suprascapular nerve. So the most important thing to remember is that if you have upper trunk damage, you're gonna lose deltoid function, which you should associate with the axillary nerve. You're also gonna lose infraspinatus function, which you should associate with the suprascapular nerve. And you're gonna lose biceps brachii function, which you should associate with the musculocutaneous nerve. Now notice that I didn't mention the suprascapular nerve's innervation of the supraspinatus, and that's intentional. It's because when you have upper trunk damage, you're not gonna have abduction of the arm via the deltoid, and technically, also via the supraspinatus muscle and its dysfunction. But when you're talking about presentation and trying to figure out how a patient will actually appear with upper trunk damage, it's easiest just to remember these three muscles, infraspinatus, biceps brachii, and deltoid. Because with the deltoid dysfunction, you're covering loss of abduction. So supraspinatus dysfunction is almost redundant and harder to remember at that point. So going back to the upper trunk, notice this motor column right here. We have the deltoid muscle, which we know performs shoulder abduction above 15 degrees, and the supraspinatus muscle, which performs shoulder abduction of the first 15 degrees, the infraspinatus muscle, which causes external rotation, remember the term infection, infraspinatus, external rotation, and then we have the biceps brachii muscle, and this causes elbow flexion and supination. Now let's discuss the sensation column. The upper trunk contains the nerves that provide sensory innervation to the shoulder and the lateral forearm. This makes sense because the upper trunk gives rise to the axillary and the suprascapular nerves, which provides sensation to the shoulder, and it gives rise to the musculocutaneous nerve, which provides innervation to the lateral forearm. Now let's talk about injury location. You can damage the upper trunk with traumatic neck and shoulder separation. This can occur during a traumatic fall or during delivery. We will talk more about this in a moment, but first let's discuss the neurological presentation of upper trunk damage. How patients with upper trunk damage present, looking over here on the right column, can actually be kind of tricky because of all the muscles that are associated with this presentation. As we discussed before, we're dealing with four muscles. And since it's hard to associate these with upper trunk damage, I provided a memory hook. Up by the deli in. Up stands for upper trunk, and by stands for biceps brachii dysfunction, which as you can see, would result in elbow extension and pronation. And this is just a repeat of what we've discussed before with the presentation of musculoskeletal nerve dysfunction. So up by the deli in. Deli stands for the deltoid muscle. And with deltoid denervation, the arm will be at the side, just like we saw with axillary nerve dysfunction up here. Up by the deli in. In stands for infraspinatus. Remember that this muscle is responsible for external rotation because of the memory hook infection. Infraspinatus, external rotation. So if it's dysfunctional, the arm would be internally rotated. If you can remember this phrase, up by the deli in, you can quickly deduce how a patient with upper trunk damage will present. Now we briefly mentioned how the upper trunk can be damaged, and that can be neck and shoulder separation, which can occur during a fall or a delivery. Let me show you what I mean by this. The brachial plexus runs through this region. If the neck and shoulder are forcefully separated, and this can occur during childbirth if the head is forcefully pulled and the shoulder remains in the birth canal, so the shoulder stays, but the head is pulled. Another scenario leading to this trauma is a fall onto the lateral neck. For example, if a person falls from a tree and hits the ground and lands directly on their neck, which sounds awful, but it's possible to happen. And if you land in this region, you can imagine a forceful separation of the head in this direction and the shoulder in this direction. So that's how you can damage the upper trunk. So now that we've covered all the information of the upper trunk, let's do a question to apply this. A 12-year-old girl presents to the emergency department following a traumatic fall from a tree she was climbing. Her parents state the impact forced her left ear to her left shoulder, 
creating a forceful stretch on the right side of her neck. Based on this history, the physician is concerned the patient may have damaged the upper trunk of her right brachial plexus. If the physician is correct, in what ways would the right arm be positioned? Okay, so if we're worried about the upper trunk being damaged, what muscles would we expect to be dysfunctional? Well, recall the memory hook up by the deli in. We're dealing with the upper trunk, which we know, and the muscles we need to think about are the biceps brachii, the deltoid muscle, and the infraspinatus muscle. So if you don't have function of the biceps brachii, the deltoid, or the infraspinatus, how would the arm be positioned? The biceps normally supinates and flexes, so her elbow, with a dysfunction, would be extended and pronated. And the deltoid is normally responsible for abduction of the arm, so the patient's arm should be at her side. And the infraspinatus normally externally rotates, recall infection, so if you can't externally rotate, she must be internally rotated. So if there was damage to the upper trunk, we would expect her arm to be at her side, her elbow to be extended and pronated, and her arm would be internally rotated. And that concludes the section.